Live, it's the Inside Scoop, Virginia. All the news Virginians want to know. Here's your host, political insider, George Burke. Welcome to Inside Scoop, Virginia. My name is George Burke. I'm your host. My guest tonight is Mike Lane, Republican consultant. I think we called you a Republican strategist tonight, Mike. However. And uh, we've got a lot of things to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about the 11th District Congressional race. Uh, we're going to talk about the failure of the bailout to pass the House of Representatives today. A big issue, a bit of a surprise to many, maybe not to some others. Uh, I know I have some friends who are freaking out over the precipitous drop uh, in the stock market today. And uh, Mike, welcome aboard. George, it's good to be back. Thank you for having me. The, uh, let me start and take a, a point of personal privilege to start with. Uh, we were originally scheduled to have a debate next Monday between Jerry Connolly, the Democrat in the 11th Congressional District running for Congress, and Keith Fimian, who's the Republican. Uh, some of you may have watched last week when Mike and I uh, did the debate between um, uh, Jim Moran, the incumbent uh, in the 8th District for Congress, and Mark Elmore. And uh, Mike has some uh, connections with Mark Elmore. I have some connections with uh, Jim Moran because, uh, although he's in the 8th District, because I'm a Democrat, Mike's a Republican. Uh, our job in that debate was not to uh, create consternation or even raise issues. Our job was to be, basically be traffic cops. And, uh, Which we I were, we, we did it very well. very well. I got no complaints certainly from the Moran camp and I didn't hear any from the Elmore camp either. Uh, well, this time it was a little different. I am the 11th Congressional District Chair and I certainly am a Connolly partisan. Uh, but again, working with the League of Women Voters, we were going to have a debate with Mike and I as the moderators. Uh, however, uh, the Fimian camp balked about me being a part of this. Uh, and one of the reasons that Mike and I were going to be part of this is that uh, there's a lot of technical jazz that has to go on. If there was no technical jazz that had to be done, we would have gladly let one of the League of Women Voters women uh, be the moderator. Uh, but that wasn't the case. So uh, Fimian backed out, hence uh, the League has canceled this debate. I think it's a shame. Uh, not that Connolly and Fimian don't have a whole bunch of other debates around the district. Uh, I've been to a number of them. Uh, and I have to admit that I think part of the reason we saw Fimian back out of this thing is that he has been doing miserably in the debates, from my perspective. Uh, I, you've seen, I think, did you ever watch the tape of the Prince William? I, I have on? not, George. I have not seen uh, those two debates. I have seen uh, Mr. Fimian from a podium, and I will uh, state my opinion. I think he's excellent. He's poised. He's uh, conversant. He's personable. Uh, he's professional at a podium. Uh, I'm disappointed that this debate did not come off as, uh, as it was uh, originally proposed. I think it would have been good for both candidates, uh, and it would have been good for the uh, voters of the 11th district as well to see them in action, particularly this kind of forum, which I think uh, is very, very conducive uh, to giving the voters uh, a, a view side by side of exactly uh, what it was about. I know that uh, I was privy to uh, a small part of the discussion on it. I was not privy to the entire part of the discussion. Uh, I can express from my point of view my disappointment that uh, the voters are not going to have the chance to see it. The, uh, you know, I can certainly understand them being a little skittish of me, uh, but I think that you and I were not only, we, we may be adversaries politically, but we're also friends and we're both professionals uh, and we would have put on a professional show. Well, the reality of the matter is uh, that time slot next Monday is still going to be filled, and I'm going to have Jerry Connolly here one-on-one -on -one for the hour. And he, if, he, he wouldn't face me, would he? No, I guess not. No, I wouldn't let <laughs> him. I wouldn't let him. But I will uh, uh, make an invite to the Finneman people if they want to. Uh, oh, by the way, I had invited the campaign manager to be on tonight, and he could have publicly expressed his concerns about me. Uh, uh, moderating, or co-moderating, I should say, because mm -hmm. certainly we shared those duties. Uh, however, uh, he declined to be on the show tonight, because uh, I'm a dirty Democrat. And, uh, Which you proudly admit. Oh yes, I proudly admit it. Uh, but I will issue an invitation to uh, Mr. Fimian right now, 
uh, that you are invited to appear on my show, not next week, that's Mr. Connolly's night, but I'll give you an hour. You'll have to face me. We'll see whether you got the guts to do it. So you are, in fact, invited to be on this show. And if you choose not to do it with me, I suspect uh, my uh, colleague Mark Levine would be happy to have you on his show if you're too scared to appear with me. So uh, the die is cast, and I hope we hear from the Fimian people. There'll be a more formal invitation made by our producers uh, within the next couple of days. Anyway, that's enough of that. In terms of these Fimi and Connolly debates, I truly think that uh, uh, Fimian's beginning to realize he has not been uh, uh, making a particularly good mark for himself at these debates. First of all, Connolly has been debating since he's 13 years old. Uh, you know, when other guys, when Fimian was playing football, Connolly was debating. Uh, that's, that's the fact. Uh, secondly, uh, Connolly, quite frankly, uh, is a policy wonk and in many ways a scholar who is disguised as a politician. Uh, at the debate yesterday um, in, uh, uh, at a synagogue in Springfield, uh, when Connolly came up, the first thing he did was wish uh, those in attendance a happy new year. Uh, Shana Tova. Spoke, yes, that, absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and address those issues, and addressed issues totally through. What I have found with Fimian during these debates, and I've been to one, two, three, four of them so far. I've been to the AARP debate. I was at a debate at the American Legion Auxiliary. I was at the Prince William Committee of 100 debate. Uh, and then I was at another one. Um, I can't remember what the other one was, but I was at another one quite recently. And the fact of the matter is, uh, he's a first-time candidate, and it shows. Uh, I agree, he's got some poise, he's got some looks, he's got the like, but once you get below the surface, he's about an inch deep and about a foot wide when he needs to be several feet deep and about a mile wide. And he, his, his staff truly needs to educate him more on issues. He's got a certain amount of points, he sticks to those points, I know he has a message, I know he's a, he has a specific attack he's waging on Connolly, but he's still got to answer the questions during these debates, and that's what I, not, I think he's not doing. And I don't want to put you in a spot because you haven't seen him. Well, in as, that, as, in as, that as, as long as you put me in the spot, George, <coughs> let, me, let me respond to what I can respond to, and that is that, uh, as, as you've just admitted, there is a such thing as message discipline. You know what you want to get out, you know what you want to leave the audience with, and you stick to that message. And when I coach people on how to go to debates, uh, it's a lot different to coach them on a political debate than it is to teach them on a high school debate where they're trying to score points and they're trying to... A political debate, you want to leave the, the, the audience with the message that you want them to be left with. Correct. And that's the way you work that. So I suspect that your complaint tells me that Fimian is doing quite well at that particular aspect of the campaign. Let me say one more thing before you come back and, and take advantage of the fact that not only is it your show, but you've seen these and I haven't. <laughs> and that second point is that uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, you know, Jerry Conley uh, may be indeed a career politician who's been out there debating since he was 13 and, and doing this and doing that, uh, but the voters should know Keith Fimian is a very, very successful businessman. Uh, he went to uh, school, he's homegrown right here in Northern Virginia, went to school here in Northern Virginia, started a company of home inspection, grew it into the largest national home inspection company. He's extraordinarily, vision, extraordinary visionary, he's successful, uh, he knows how to run a business, and he can bring that perspective to government. And I think the voters would be well served by that. I got to tell you. Uh, As he, opposed to the career politician, Jerry, who has never met a payroll. Uh, actually, Jerry has forever uh, worked, uh, you know, even as chairman of the Board of Supervisors, he's always had a second job. Uh, being a, a right. Member of the Board a of lot Supervisors. of controversy associated with that second job, too, isn't there? Uh, I thought uh, allegations of conflict of interest forever. Yeah, except uh, voting, that voting on different things uh, transportation wise that might be in the best interest of his employer. But also in the best interest of the county. Uh, sometimes you, so you could say that, and sometimes you wouldn't say that, depending on the cost. But he always votes in favor of his employer. Well, in the case of Femian, the, uh, the reality of the matter is, is he just doesn't have a grasp of the issues. His view of transportation is, let's add some, let's use the breakdown lanes on Route 1 to solve the transportation problems when they cite That the would help me tomorrow. That would help me tomorrow. Unless you were in an automobile accident and the public safety folks couldn't make it up the breakdown lane to get to you then it wouldn't help anybody. Or if the cops couldn't get through for an emergency situation. Uh, you know, the, the, you hear very little about public transportation 
from them. You hear very little about clustering development around metro stations, which has been very successful in, in, in your perch in the People's Republic of Ireland. Well, in Arlington it has, but as, as you know, but may have just temporarily forgotten, I have relocated to the city of Alexandria. Ah, that's right. And yeah. they have done an absolutely miserable job in terms of clustering develop around the met metro stations. Mm -hmm. The Alexandria metro stations are the most underutilized stations in the entire system. Yeah, but uh, what the Arlington model has worked, and I think a lot of what Connolly proposes is along those lines. And of course, Connolly's talking from a federal perspective now. He's talking, first of all, getting the money into Virginia, just as Tom Davis has. And uh, uh, Easy to say nice things about Congressman Davis on his way out, isn't it? Absolutely. Last year, uh, two years ago, we were complaining that he voted with Bush 90% of the right. time. But we also understood that if he didn't, he literally uh, would have lost his chairmanship. Not that that uh, is is something that should there are there are certain rules recognized. of the game. Yes, yes, and the Republicans uh, have pretty good uh, uh, unity, except when it comes to this bailout legislation. But I think we'll save that for the next. Quarter. I'm looking forward to it. It's a uh, it's a, a mess, and uh, uh, some of the things I'm reading in the Post article here are pretty amazing. Anyway, uh, I think that Connolly is moving toward a uh, a strong victory in November. Uh, I think Fimian is waging a spirited contest, but he's clearly a first timer. You know, he's running against Connolly as if he was running for chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors instead of running for Congress. On one hand, he talks about the cuts he wants to make in Washington. On the other hand, he decries the fact that there may have to be some cuts made in Fairfax. It just doesn't uh, uh, make sense. Uh, uh, he certainly uh, and freely admits that he opposes uh, abortion, uh, but he's a little hazy on the rest of the facts there. And in terms of his business, I understand, at least in one debate, that he announced he'd resigned from his business in Prince William. Haven't heard him say it since, but on two or three occasions during the Prince William debate, he made a point of noting that he had resigned from the company. I don't know what the mm. purpose of doesn't, that is. It doesn't negate his track record of being extraordinarily visionary, successful, starting a national home inspection business. A very good man. Sued we'll 40 or so times, according to the Democratic Congressional If you're in business committee. and you don't get sued, you're not, you're not, doing, you're not successful. All. And also, uh, I saw, according to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, that in fact he had, uh, uh, had some tax liens and stuff against him as well. Uh, but I guess that's part of being in business. Uh, you can't be a large national corporation and not have somebody out there someplace who wants to take you to court. It's the nature of our system. I'll join uh, with you, George, in trying to reform our uh, legal system if you'd want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I have a lawsuit going. I'd rather, you know, I could uh, buy into that a little bit. Anyway, uh, we are going to come to a break, and I don't want to. Uh, belabor the Femian thing because he decided not to come on and certainly I'm not happy about that. I don't think the League is happy about that, although I can't speak for them. Uh, and I will reiterate that uh, uh, Mr. Femian is in fact invited to appear on this show. If he chooses not to be on with me, uh, he can be on with our host, uh, Mark Levine. Uh, having said that, our call-in number here is 571-749-1166. My host tonight is Mike Lane, as you can see, who's a very capable spin doctor. I don't have to worry about uh, whatever I say with him. He will have a comeback. Uh, he's probably going to have some pretty good spin on the debacle that occurred in the House of Representatives today. And if you want to talk about the bailout, give us a call back. We'll be back in two minutes. Monica and her friends want you to know that you should never get near a dog when it is eating, playing with a favorite toy, or sleeping. It's really important to make time for exercise and games and keep your dog's vaccines up to date. Never leave a dog in a small, confined space. This can make dogs aggressive like Monica. If you follow this advice, you and your dog can play safely and happily together. Heart disease. But did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. Mark and I thought, 
air pollution, global warming. How can we make a difference? So first things first, Mark modified our car. He harnessed the wind. Then he experimented with microwave technology and some sort of homemade energy source. The best part is the car emits only helium. <laughs> Genius. Genius. But the EPA says the energy we use in our home can cause twice the greenhouse gases of a car. So I went to energystar.gov. I got tips on lighting, heating and cooling, and to look for the Energy Star on products we buy. As for Mark, he still marches to the beat of a different drum. I figure why not let gravity do all the work, right? <laughs> I know I'm making a difference. I just look for the Energy Star. The Environmental Protection Agency encourages you to visit energystar.gov to discover what you can do. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop of Virginia. Welcome back. My guest today is Republican consultant Mike Lane. Uh, what happened this afternoon is rather historic, probably, I'd almost describe it as prehistoric. Uh, the House narrowly defeats bailout legislation, according to the headline on the Washington Post website at 512 tonight. In the narrow vote, the House today rejected the most sweeping government intervention into the nation's financial markets since the Great Depression, refusing to grant the Treasury Department the power to purchase up to $700 billion in troubled assets that are the heart of the U.S. financial crisis. Vote was 228 to 205. A majority of Democrats voted for it. A majority of Republicans voted against it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the crisis came in under President Bush's watch. The uh, the, uh, uh, the president and his treasury secretary begged the Congress to do something on this. Uh, McCain came out, uh, uh, Steve Schmidt on Sunday on Meet the Press made a big deal about how they were helping to solve this crisis and Obama was doing nothing. This morning McCain was in Columbus, Ohio taking credit for pushing this thing through, etc. And then of course it fell flat on its face. Apparently, Nancy Pelosi gave a speech where she took a whack at Bush. Uh, like uh, a, a rather extended, scurrilous whack at Bush. Correct. It was but, not but just a whack. As Barney Frank pointed out, it must have hurt some of the Republicans' feelings because that was what uh, Boehner suggested. That may have been what prompted a majority of Republicans to vote against the bill. And uh, there was a quote here from Frank saying this is a terrible crisis affecting the American economy. I've come together on a bill to alleviate the crisis, and because somebody hurt their feelings, they decided to punish the country. Uh, he actually said he was willing to uh, uh, meet with 12 Republicans and treat them very nicely if that maybe would change their minds on the thing. But the fact of the matter is, it was the Republicans who created this mess, it was the Republicans who came up with a solution. Uh, it was McCain who went after Obama and was, was praising his work on bringing this thing together. And then it fell on its face. And after the fact, McCain's people have now changed their tune. And they're just outright blaming Obama because he must have showed up at the meeting or something. How can you blame the Democrats when they pulled a majority of their members to vote for a piece of legislation that was created by a Republican administration. Well, George, not surprisingly to our viewers or to you, I probably have a somewhat different perspective I'm on this sure, whole thing. I'm sure, and I'll, I'll stay quiet. I'll let you go for a couple minutes. Give me of 30 minutes. seconds or you whatever. Got, you, got uh, you know, let, let's talk about where the leadership is on this. The, the leadership, uh, well, it, it, this was not something that was created on George Bush's watch. It was something that bubbled over uh, in the last uh, uh, probably three weeks uh, in that area. But this, this has been 20 years or, or 30 years uh, in the making. The fact is, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac never should have been created in the first place because what the government was trying to do, although it may have been a worthy objective, is not a function of government. And they were trying to distort the market and make sure that people who couldn't otherwise get loans in a free and open market could get it. Why is that a function of government? I'm not clear. But that was what started us down this whole thing. Now let's talk about one of the leaders that you wanted to talk about, Barney Frank. Barney is probably the single most person responsible for this 
uh, entire thing happening. Every time in the last 20 years that some effort of reform has tried to come at the mortgage market or Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Barney Frank has single-handedly stood in the way denying that there's any problem, denying that there's a crisis looming, denying this. The Wall Street Journal did an excellent piece on this about one week ago. And, and Barney Frank is actually the prince of, uh, of Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. He, he's the guy who stopped the reforms. You know, it's been widely reported, our viewers probably know widely reported, that it was in 2005 when John McCain was one of four senators who were aggressively pursuing reforms to this uh, mortgage market. And of course, they were unsuccessful uh, in getting that through the Congress. Uh, they did get it through the committee on a straight party line vote. Every single uh, Democrat voted against the reforms that would have uh, prevented this problem. Uh, and it never saw the light of day on, uh, on the Senate floor because, of course, the new rules in the Senate where you need 60 votes to pass anything controversial, uh, they clearly weren't going to have the 60 votes. Finally, let's talk about Barack Obama's leadership. You know, interestingly, Obama never endorsed this legislation publicly. Now, I understand he claims that he made a couple phone calls to some wavering Democrats I gotta, and I asked them if they could do question. that. I got to ask you one question. If had he endorsed it, would more Republicans, would that have swayed some Republicans? No, the majority but ultimately, ultimately, up, ultimately, it's up to the majority party to get something through. And although 133 Republicans did vote against it, 95 Democrats voted against it. If Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama could have flipped eight of those 95 Democrats who voted against it, it would have passed by one vote, but they couldn't do that. Uh, was it Obama's fault? Probably not. Was it Pelosi's fault? Oh, quite possibly. Uh, but they only needed eight more votes on this whole thing. But and, it's and not, they couldn't get it. You've and, got and you know the why? president uh, of the United States Georgia, urging him to do it. You've got the Treasury Secretary urging him to do it. You have the leader, John Boehner, the House Republican leader, desperately seeking votes among the Republicans, and they still could not do it. You have John McCain thrusting himself into the middle of the process, declaring victory in Columbus, Ohio this morning before the vote, only to have to eat his words later today. Uh, you know, Obama wasn't, wasn't the one who even wanted to come back to Washington. It was McCain. McCain wanted to cancel the debate Friday night because they truly want to cancel this vice presidential debate good, next Thursday. Good thing he went through with it. He did a fantastic job and won, according to most people. But he lost. No, he won. Oh, the debate. Oh, yes. the debate. I'm talking about what he did today. Uh, I disagree. I think that uh, right. there here's, was a lot here, of here's, here's why this went down. The, the administration and the Democratic and the Republican leaders in Congress did a lousy job on selling this to the American people. At one point over the weekend, the polling showed that only 24 percent of the American public actually supported this. Now, that rebounded up to about 31 percent. Uh, in the time frame uh, since then, but when you've got 31% of the American people and they are all, and the rest of them are all phoning Congress saying no, no, no. If you look at the roughly 200 members of Congress who voted against this, I would venture to guess that 80% of them have races that are polling in the single digits at this point. It's within nine points or less, and though it's only the people with the safe districts that went out there and did the uh, the right thing and uh, voted for it. Why should John McCain be president? If he was only able to convince 65 Republicans in the House, 133 voted against John McCain and George Bush. If he was only able to convince 65 Republicans to vote for this piece of legislation, what kind of president is he going to be? What kind of authority is he going to carry in that House? If he has no ability to sway him, he has no more ability to sway him than W has. George, you know I let Barack Obama off the hook when I said it probably was not his fault, and I'm going to do the same for John McCain. Probably not his fault. Wasn't his job to get those votes. It was his job to cheerlead. It was his job to endorse it, which he did. It was his job to contribute to the solution and the compromise, which he did. Uh, ultimately, though, it was the president and the speaker and the minority leader whose job it was to round up the votes. And collectively, the three of them did not did not do the job. Sounds like the Democrats did a heck of a lot better job of rounding them up than the Republicans did. Uh, you one, know, ultimately, the party in charge of the House is the one responsible for passing the legislation, and Pelosi couldn't get it done. 
usually you don't get a piece of legislation thrust on you urging you to vote on it three days later, which is what Paulson did to the House of right. Representatives. And, and we'll see another three days. On Thursday, I understand we're going to take another bite at this apple, and we'll see what happens I, then. But we'll see. If the we'll stock see. market does the same thing in the next three days that it did today, I would imagine that we're going to find those extra eight votes. If the stock market does the same thing in the next three days that it did today, there's going to be an awful lot of people our age who are planning to retire who are now going to have to just go back to work for another Up, decade. Upward mobility so. of the younger workers is going to slow down. I'll tell you what. It's, uh, you know, I've talked to two different friends of mine today uh, who are in their about 60-ish, early 60s. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a defined benefits mm -hmm. pension plan. Most of them don't. They have 401ks. And as a result, they've seen the value of their retirement fund decrease dramatically over the, the past few weeks. Obviously, it's been on a roller coaster, but they're facing a steady decline. Uh, this is not just impacting, uh, you know, I've had a few people say, well, it just affects the rich. Well, that's not true. It affects the average Joe because the average Joe today no longer has defined benefits plans. They have 401ks. You know, at one point, the Republicans were talking about letting people take their money out of Social Security and put it into these things. Still a capital a idea, lot. by the way. There would be a lot, although Keith Fimian would not endorse that. Uh, there are, he can be wrong on something. Uh, he's wrong <laughs> on a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of middle-class uh, Americans who are sweating right now. Forget the foreclosure side of it. Now, not only are their houses losing value, which was going to contribute to their retirement, their retirement funds are losing value. They are. And you know what? The, the person who I spoke with today who was the most distressed about this and, and really was looking forward to some action was my dear, sweet, 85-year-old mother uh, who told me <coughs> almost to the penny how much she's lost in the last uh, several weeks uh, and is looking forward to another uh, attempt at this on Thursday and to see if the Congress maybe can't uh, come to the conclusion. Uh, you know, from a policy standpoint, George, I think, hopefully, Republicans think, I think, I can't speak for the entire party, uh, that this bailout bill is abysmal. It's absolutely the worst thing we could possibly do ever under any circumstances with the exception of doing nothing. I think everybody, I think everybody thinks that. I think the Democrats think that too. But let me ask you a question. The Republicans didn't support this thing the first time. Now they're turning around and they're blaming and we'll have to get to this after the break, and they're blaming the Democrats. You think the Democrats are going to be playing the same kind of ball when we get to Thursday? We'll see. I mean, I'm not so sure. I, mean, I, think, I, mean, I don't have I any think, inside information. I, I don't either, so but sure. I can tell you one of the reasons the Republicans did not, or the, the, the conservative Republican caucus did not play ball was because they were excluded from the whole thing. And if you want to have a compromise and bring everybody into the tent, you bring them in in the beginning when the discussions take place. You don't keep them outside and give them the take it or leave it. We'll see what happens over the next three days. It amazes me that they were excluded from the White House. Anyway, we'll be back in two minutes. Our phone number is 571-749-1166. My guest is Mike Lane, and uh, I appreciate you having it. I'd love to argue with you, and we'll see you at the turnaround. Bye. Neglected or abused children facing a court system that determines their future can be frightening. Lawyers speak for the law, and social workers speak about family options. But who speaks for the children? Fairfax CASA, or court-appointed special advocates do. CASA volunteers get to know the child, their situations, their problems and fears, their hopes and dreams, and report back to the courts with the objective, important information needed to make the best possible decision for the child's welfare and future. To learn how you can volunteer to help a child in need, contact Fairfax CASA at 703-273-3526 or on the web at www.casafairfax.org. CASA Volunteers, a powerful voice. Is a banana. This is a cat. This is fire. This is harmless and actually helpful to some people. Don't believe everything you hear. The fact is that every major health organization rejects smoked marijuana. Now that the smoke is cleared, discover true compassion. Should I be planning better for retirement? Isn't it about time to renew my driver's license? 
If I go back to school, can I get a student loan? Will Medicare cover tattoo removal? Can Social Security cut? Relax, Tony. Go to firstgov.gov. They've got all the answers. The answers to all your government questions are always right there. Can we get some pancakes? Just log on or email first. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop of Virginia. I watched that last public service announcement with interest. I don't think anybody's looking to the government for answers right now. They haven't been able to solve anything. Uh, I want to, again, my guest is Mike Lane. I want to read a couple of quotes here, Mike, and then I'll let you respond to them. Uh, Steve Schmidt, uh, chief strategist for uh, McCain, uh, along with Rick Davis, who I think was like the chief lob, one of the chief lobbyists for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or one of those. Well, the Fannie or Freddie crowd. Along and, with, along with uh, Barack Obama. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, here's what Schmidt said. He boasted Sunday that it was the senator from Arizona who had brokered it. ...to this table, including the House Republicans, whose votes... ...just hours before the failed vote, McCain said, I think it was in Columbus, Ohio, I went to Washington last week to make sure the taxpayers of Ohio and across this great country were not left footing the bill for mistakes made on Wall Street and evil and greed in Washington. Uh, You know, again, he was taking a great deal of credit for this process, et cetera, for bringing the House Republicans in, Mm -hmm. and then the House Republicans turn around and screw them. Things were hurt. What's this say deal? What Senator McCain was able to do is to help bring all the parties for McCain's leadership. What's this say for, and and don't get me wrong, I understand that you've got to, or screw the process, because they, they feel, keep your eye on the polls when you're running for Congress. Both of us, you and I have been in that tent. We understand how it works, and understand you can't do any good if you're not reelected, if you're not elected, et cetera. But nonetheless, we have this major crisis uh, the, the proposal advanced by uh, the Republicans, uh, the Democrats made changes, a couple of the changes, holding their nose to suit the Republicans. The Republicans agreed to a couple of changes, such as limiting uh, CEO salaries and, and golden parachutes to appease the Democrats. There was a lot of discussion on this thing, and it falls apart. But the fact of the matter is McCain was taking all the credit uh, prematurely. Uh, now they're backtracking like crazy. They did the thing Republicans always do. They turned around and said, really, that doesn't matter. That's in the past. Let's not pay the blame, Gabe. And then they turn around and they blame Obama, just as you have. I, again, will let Senator Obama off the hook as I let Senator McCain off the hook. Uh, their job was to cheerlead. Their job was to buy in. They issued a joint statement uh, buying into the whole thing. Uh, It was ultimately the president and the leaders of both parties who needed to deliver a majority of the House of Representatives. The failure lays at the doorstep of John Boehner, Nancy Pelosi, and George Bush. What did John McCain bring to the table? The only thing he's ever had to do with the financial community is the savings and loan crisis and the only guy out of the Keating Five who didn't go to jail. He was certified innocent by an (laughs) investigatory committee. Correct, correct, but he's the only one who didn't go to jail. He himself admits that he doesn't have uh, much knowledge of the economy. And uh, uh, here he comes like the, the, you know, riding his white horse into the middle of this process. And uh, uh, nobody wanted him. In fact, when his first major step in the process was, in fact, uh, appearing at the White House. And Obama came to the White House. And afterwards, you know, Chris Dodd walked out and said, this is nothing but a photo op for John McCain. Well, I would expect Chris Dodd to say that, as I would expect Harry Reid, the Democratic leader in the Senate, uh, to make a statement on Tuesday uh, that Senator McCain has to weigh in on this. Senator McCain has to support it. Uh, this is not coming to a vote until Senator McCain says he's behind it. And then on Wednesday, when Senator McCain says, I'm going to come and help do this, Harry Reid says, no, Senator McCain is not welcome in Washington. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of personal uh, partisan politics going oh, of on. Of course, here, of course. And, and, I mean, we're, doing, we're playing the same game right. here. Uh, 
Uh, but the fact of the matter is, McCain is not on any of the applicable committees that have any, but, anything to but, do but with But he this. is the titular head of the party at Well, this point. if he's the titular head of the party, then you have to admit he failed at least this first time in getting this thing. I heard today that this guy was working the phones, calling Republicans, et cetera, throughout the process. And if he cannot sway, Obama clearly swayed a majority of the Democrats. Let's talk about uh, where some of the stories are that this vote was lost. Uh, there were... Uh, there was a, a statement from John Boehner, the Republican leader in the House, uh, that there were up to 12 Republicans uh, who they had in their whip count who were prepared to vote uh, affirmatively, uh, which would have given about a, an eight-vote cushion to the, uh, to the legislation, uh, that ultimately uh, failed to vote yes and voted no. And he assigned some level of responsibility to their reaction to Speaker Pelosi's uh, speech in the well of the House. Now, for readers who don't know, when the speaker actually leaves the, the rostrum and goes down in the well to speak, it, it is so infrequent and precedent setting that this is, this is a big, huge deal. And she took the time down there uh, not to talk about the bipartisan compromise, not to talk about how good it was for the country, not to talk about where, what it was going to do and, and where it was going. But she took her five minutes in the well to talk about how this was all George Bush's fault and it was all the failed Republican ideology and all the re failed Republican this and failed Republican that. And allegedly there were upwards towards 12 Republicans who said, you know what, Madam Speaker, do this with Democratic votes. You're not going to do it with our votes. And, and if that was indeed the case, uh, you know, this was a time to bring people together, not to divide people, and the speaker just misread the situation. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. The almost doesn't count except in hand grenades, horseshoes, and atom bombs. What Boehner and B Roy Blunt the, could have produced was not produced. The f you know, this was a time to bring people together, not to... The fact is that the Republicans failed on this thing, the fact is they could not even marshal a majority of their people. This goes against what Republicans they and were never, Democrats They, they were never expected to marshal a majority of their people. They went into that meeting in the White House. Remember, that was the day after the Republican caucus met. And the bill, the bill as pending on Wednesday uh, or Thursday, I think the meeting was on, uh, no, the meeting was on Thursday. So the bill pending on Wednesday was discussed by the House Republican caucus, and they took a straw poll, and it had exactly four votes in favor of it. So they went from four to 67 or whatever the magic number was. Uh, it was never expected there was going to be a majority of Republicans. Republicans, again, believe more in free markets than government intervention. Uh, there are some people who, uh, even in the, uh, in, in, in the face of the enormity of what is looking us down the barrel, uh, decided they were going to stick to principles rather than practicality. Uh, I don't blame people for sticking to principles. I'm more of a practical person uh, myself. If I need to shave uh, three or four percent off a principle in order to get something good done, I will do it. Other people are principled. I don't think you can criticize them for standing on their principles. They were always there. The Republicans were never expected to produce a majority. Uh, they fell uh, a dozen short of what the original projection was. Uh, but again, if, if Speaker Pelosi either didn't give the speech or if she could produce eight more Democratic votes out of the 95 that abandoned her, we'd be looking at a different topic to talk about tonight. Since when do you base your vote? Since when do you base uh, an issue that's impacting the country on what somebody says to you from the rostrum, what some, that somebody takes a shot at you, that that causes you I think to change your principles, to change your vote, etc. I think it's childish, I think it's petty, and I think it reflects what the, how the Republicans function in Congress. I, I, I think it was... Keep them in, it'll just give us more. I think, I think it was, it was a, a simple uh, matter of, okay, Madam Speaker, uh, if that's the way you want to play this game, if everybody else here is being bipartisan and you want to be the partisan one there and throw insults around uh, and, and, and muck up the water that's been soothed, then we're going to let you do this with your own party's votes, and she failed to do it. I think that uh, there were never enough Republican votes for this piece of legislation. Perhaps it's not. It's easy to say, well, we had the votes, but you know, you hurt our feelings, so no longer. Are we uh, you know what? You know what, George? I, I, you, you may be right. Us I don't. We are changing our votes. 
we're throwing the 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 economy out with the dishwater because you said bad you things may be, about maybe you, you may be right. I don't have any inside information. I don't know what the actual whip count was, although it's been reported what the whip count was. But if I was, if I was the leader uh, on the Republican Party, I would have gone to the parties that be and said, OK, guys, we're about eight votes short here now. This is one more incremental thing we've got to do or whatever it is to make that happen. You don't go to a vote like this and miss it by, uh, by a, a mere eight votes. It, it just would not have been a good strategy on any side. It, uh, uh, you know, one of the things it said, Roy Blunt, who was the, the, He's the whip. vote counter, He's the, whip. the whip for the Republicans, uh, was pulled in 30 retiring Republicans and virtually begged them to, uh, 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 to do this. Uh, we are going to be taking a break in a little less than a minute. Uh, I'm enjoying this debate immensely. We don't do this very often. You tend to do this more with my colleague Mark Levine than with me. And uh, uh, it's, it, you make somebody think all the time. And I, well, you know what, George? I find that when I'm with you, I get to actually think about things a little bit more than I do with uh, your colleagues. So. Well, maybe that's because I'm slower off the mark. Anyway, we are going to be taking a break. My guest is Mike Lane. Uh, and uh, we will be back La. in two minutes. La. James, don't forget your helmet. Will do. La. 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 Your bike helmet. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm James Thrash with the Washington Redskins. On the football field, a helmet is an important piece of equipment. I also wear another helmet that's just as important. A bike helmet. It's the most important piece of equipment you'll have the next time you're out on your bike. Wear yours and make sure your kids do too. Safety first. With the... You don't think much about homelessness, but these children have. They're just a few of the fortunate ones being helped by Homestretch. Homestretch Inc. is a nonprofit organization that provides transitional housing and support services to over 100 families and 300 children each year credit, budget, legal and employment counseling, job, parenting and life skills training, English as a second language classes, and child and teen programs are helping families return to self-sufficiency and stable housing. For more about Homestretch and how you can help, contact them at 703-237-2035 or on the web at www.homestretchinc.com. Org. Home stretch. Getting families off the street and back on their feet. receipt confirmation and a quicker refund. Log on or tell your tax preparer to e-file for you and join the 53 million e-filers who... Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop of Virginia. Welcome back. Uh, Mike, I'm going to read a couple of lines as the post. Okay. Uh, describes uh, Pelosi's speech. Pelosi tried to assure her most liberal colleagues that further bailout hearings and legislation would come next year. Knowing that her party was fearful of how many Republicans would support them, speaking on the floor of the House in the final minutes before the close vote, that liberal bastion of liberal. The House was, organ for the Democratic right, bill. Pelosi noted the bipartisan talks over the last week and the pledges made among both sides' leaders to rally support. I know we will live up to our side of the bargain. I hope the Republicans will too, she said. Had Nasty she, language. Had she, left Nasty it at, language. had she left it at that, she'd have been fine. But when she started talking about how did we get here, this is 100% George Bush's fault. This is, you know, the failed Republican ideology of the last seven years. This is this Republican and that Republican. Had she just left it at the bipartisan talk, everything would have been fine, George. But no, she had to precede that with her comments about uh, Bush and the Republican ideology. 
and it was a tactical mistake. There was no need for her to be that partisan on a bipartisan day. Let me quote, well, first of all, I don't think it was a bipartisan day. We're 33 or 35 days from the election. The fact of the matter is nothing's bipartisan Let, at this stage Let's call it a, a, a bipartisan hour, <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. it was supposed to be. Well, George Bush wants it. The Treasury Secretary wants it. The Republican that, leader and Democratic leader in both houses wanted it. The Democratic leader had no choice. Democratic leader mm -hmm. was putting out, uh, looking out for the country. The Republicans right. were looking out for their own butts. At the beginning of the floor speech, urging support for the bill, but I'll give you this, pull up, but I'm going to quote her. Pelosi denounced the $700 billion price tag as, quote, the costs of the Bush administration's failed economic policies. Just about everybody agrees with that. Policies built on budgetary recklessness, on an anything goes mentality, with no regulation, no supervision, and no discipline in the system. George, the cause is 30 plus or more years of the government trying to manipulate the market and trying to create things that wouldn't ordinarily be there. But it's perhaps all a worthy objective, but not a function of government. And the more long term you manipulate the market, and then when you start manipulating it deeper and deeper and deeper by requiring banks as a as a uh, uh, as a condition of then getting their mortgages being able to be sold to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mac, um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, to issue even more mortgages to people who otherwise uh, the government created the subprime market. If it never created it in the first place, we would never have the subprime. It's not George Bush. It's it's the Congress that created this. It's the mentality of deregulation. It's the mentality, you know, what's going to turn around on this whole matter, what's going to come out of this is you're going to see more regulation of the maybe federal regulation of insurance companies. You're going to see regulation of investment banks. It was like the Wild West. It was literally a situation where anything goes, as Pelosi said. To the extent that the government taxpayer money is being used to help and assist any, any corporations or individuals and who may benefit from this whole thing, I have no problem with regulatory strings being attached to that. That's absolutely appropriate. Uh, the taxpayer interests uh, must be held you know, at a higher level than anything else. Uh, and if, if as a condition of receiving this kind of government uh, assistance, uh, we are going to impose certain regulations. That's absolutely fine with me. The, uh, uh, the reality of the matter, though, is under the Republican regime, we have seen regulations thrown out the window. We have seen uh, the, the wild, reckless gestures on the part of the Republicans as they played in the financial market. Uh, I had one person suggest to me, and I don't necessarily believe this myself, that one reason a lot of the Republicans opposed this was because they were putting limits on CEO salaries and CEO benefits and the like. Look, you know, f first of all, it makes no sense to me that the guys who brought us this crisis uh, get kicked out of their companies. No, no strict regulations, you know, apply to them. They can get their golden parachutes because they have their contracts in place. They have their their astronomical CEO salaries. And then you bring in the good guys, the posse that's going to set it right, and you punish them by telling them that they're not allowed to be compensated. It, it's backwards. It seems to me that you need to find a way to punish the people who got us in this mess, not the people who are going to get us out of this mess. Uh, I don't know how constitutionally perhaps that might be done, uh, but, but there's, there's a disconnect there with the way we're approaching the CEO salary thing. Well, it'll be very interesting in the, in the long run. And I mean, history is going to tell the story when we're long gone. But it'll be interesting over the next week or two to see how this is played in the minds of the voters. Uh, I personally think that this is ultimately a devastating blow for John McCain. I truly think this is going to hurt him in the eyes of a lot of those undecided voters in the middle. You and I both know you, most of the people on right. the Democratic side have made their decision. The, the, most of the people the, the, on the Republican side. The 45 percent on both sides right. are, are locked. It's just that the 10 small in the people middle. in the middle. And uh, uh, at this point, I don't think that most people truly do know what's going on. I was listening to a radio report on the way over here, and they're blaming both of them. They're blaming the Republicans. They're blaming the Democrats. They are. But I think as this story trickles out in terms of how this came about, and people realize that a majority of Republicans did not support this piece of legislation that was offered by their president that was 
uh, called basically do or die by their president. I know you're all running away from him, but he is your president. He's America's president, George. Correct. Uh, you know, let's talk about what the campaigns will, will talk about over the next five weeks, because uh, that is what we're down to. Correct. Informing the American people that three years ago he was pushing for legislation. Uh, and did not get it through Congress. Uh, about how, uh, in a 20 year study, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Chris Dodd from Connecticut 27, you'll see a lot of commercials about how sort the of like the got the most money from Fetty, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the second one most uh, vo vociferous recipient is Barack Obama with only three years in the Senate. Uh, there will probably not come from the McCain campaign, but likely from the five. We're going to do business differently, and we're going to get rid of the lobbyists. How's he going? Uh, that's the kind of thing as, as Barack Obama tries to say, well, uh, you know, John McCain will start advertising. Uh, and the amount of money of any member of the United States Senate going back and measuring it 20 years. And again, that'll come from a 527. It won't come from the McCain campaign. So, you know what? There's, there's more than enough blame to go around here. There's going to be uh, a lot of blame thrown back and forth. Surprise, surprise. There's going to be politics entering a campaign. I'm shocked and appalled. Uh, but uh, we'll see how the American people buy it. It ultimately may turn on a different issue other than this. We don't know. That's what campaigns are all about. 35 days is five weeks. That's five political lifetimes. You and I have both been party to creating some of this noise over the years that occurs mm -hmm. in these campaigns. Played, so do you. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that neither candidate will be taken. Uh, and I don't make any bones about it. I know how the game is. Telling the truth. And uh, hopefully the media is going to, so, you know, I see the media doing to McCain what they're currently doing to Sarah Palin. Uh, and I want to get to her at least for one or two minutes. I don't want to be glad her. to bring her up. Uh, the, uh, they're going to show McCain this morning talking about how he's got this thing in the bag and his, he's got the Republicans, you know, moving forward, et cetera, which as the leader of the titular head of the Republican Party, quote unquote, Mike Lane, right. he should be able to move his people. Well, the real head is George Bush, of course. I know, uh, the titular uh, head. Titular head. Yeah. And that's why he came to the White House and uh, wreaked havoc in that meeting. And they came out in worse shape than when they went in. You know, it's amazing that only the Democrats came out and said that it was havoc. <laughs> Republicans had a totally, again, I'm shocked, shocked to hear that there's politics the Democrats, going on in the campaign. The bottom line is the Democrats got a majority of their uh, people to support this in the Congress, and the Republicans failed to get a majority of their people to support it. Uh, and, and it was advocated by a Republican president. Simple as that. Unfortunately, that is not how it will be presented to the public. To those, and let's face it, many of those people in the middle are these so-called low-information voters who mm -hmm. will draw their conclusions off these ads in the final mm -hmm. weeks. And unless you need to have a last word, I'd like to move on to Palin. But I will let's talk about Governor. No, I'll talk about Governor Palin. Uh, I am not one of these people who uh, advocates constantly bashing her because I think it takes the focus away from uh, what did Paris Hilton call him the gray-haired shrivelly face guy <laughs> that was a very clever <laughs> ad that uh, young Miss Hilton uh, got up there. Uh, did you happen to see Saturday Night Live or did you uh, see it on the web or anything after the, uh, the piece they did on Palin on the front end. Uh, yes I did and I thought it was about as funny as it gets yes, it was yeah. It, it was it was perfect. It was. It was pretty funny, and it was you know I mean obviously satire. But the fact of the matter is, what happened this morning is what opened my eyes. This morning, I think it was on the Today Show. They were, of course, Tina Fey, Fey looks so much like her when right. they make her up that way. It's shocking. I mean, it, it's uncanny. But they ran. She certainly plays a better uh, Sarah Palin than uh, the Hillary Clinton yes, look alike. Yeah, you I know? agree. I agree. And they had Sarah Palin, they showed a split screen. They had Sarah Palin speaking here and Tina, Tina Fey. Fey speaking here. And what you realized is the dialogue that Tina Fey delivered in that Saturday Night Live piece was actually what Sarah Palin said to Katie Couric 
on that program. Okay, so they, was they, they took different pieces of it. Okay. It was devastating. Um, the Katie Couric... But of course it depends on the context and, and the sequence true, and things true, like that. True. But so. it was a fairly long clip and it was her when she was asked, I think, about uh, uh, the economy and she ended up talking about health care and then foreign policy and this and that uh, all in one breath. Um, how is she going to handle herself on this debate? What's going to be the strategy well, we're going to find of out. the Republicans? I mean, how if you were advising her, she clearly has a way to go in terms of, she reminds me of Keith Fimian, actually. All right. In terms of <laughs> not having a, a lot of depth. Some of that come, I'm, I, and I'm never going to suggest that Keith Fimian's not an intelligent man. He certainly is, and he's certainly been successful. But when it comes to policy issues, you need to send somebody to Congress who understands them. Uh, and I don't think he does. And I think you're having the same issue uh, with the woman who's going to be one heartbeat away from the president, uh, that she truly doesn't understand these issues. Uh, and uh, and I, I will give you one more thing. You, uh, any of these folks are surrounded by people who have expertise, et cetera, mm -hmm. and help them make decisions. But ultimately, the buck president, the buck stops with the president. Um, So that you prepare for a high school or a college team debate much differently than you prepare for a political Correct. debate. Uh, they ha they are going to have certain things they want Palin to get across, as the Democrats are going to have certain things they want Biden to get across. Uh, ultimately, it's not going to be one on who's scoring points the way you would a college team debate. It's going to be one on who meets or exceeds the expectations for them more so than their opponent was in the whole thing. Biden has certain expectations. Palin probably has lesser expectations of her. We'll see who exceeds the expectations. And the last thing is, who comes across as just more likable, uh, more honest, uh, more just regular, everyday average Joe or regular, everyday average Sarah? And I think the American people uh, are going to be very influenced uh, by that kind of thing. And, and we'll see. Team, I would go back to the same way they prepped Reagan for the second debate. Let Sarah be Sarah. Don't try and create somebody that she's not. Let her be herself. The, uh, that, that's scary. <laughs> it's good, George. <laughs> it's Thursday night. I hope our it's viewers scary. will watch. I hope our viewers, it's, it's Thursday scary. night. Tune in. Now, let's go back to the presidential debate. McCain had something he had to do. He had to look a little bit, uh, he, he couldn't look old and tired, he didn't. Uh, he had to be a little bit uh, more detailed and policy knowledgeable than Obama was, and, and he did, but what Obama had to do was, look, they've called you an experience, they said you're not ready, don't get blown off the stage, he didn't. He accomplished what he yeah. needed to do. I think, I think the most damning criticism of Obama is he agreed with John McCain too much. Eight times, and, I counted and, them. And the Republicans immediately jumped on Right, within, within 20 minutes yeah. they had that commercial yeah. up. I it will was never, amazing. I will never argue that the Republicans are masters of the message. Uh, they have been since the days when I worked on the Hill, which is a couple of decades, over a couple of decades mm -hmm. ago now. I mean, they got their message out in three or four bullets. The Democrats put their message out. It's longer than this, you right. know, and you have to wade through it to find the penult penultimate uh, sentence. Uh, and they're very good at that. But I think what we saw today is maybe Mr. McCain is not very good at leading. And, uh, you know, we'll see in, in a few weeks. Well, I think and, the American people would disagree, but we will see in a couple that. weeks. And they have another debate coming back between uh, right. McCain and Obama after the vice president's debate on Thursday, which I hope our viewers watch. Mike, it was a pleasure to have you. You know, we beat each other up a little bit, but it's fun. And, uh, you know, I still love you, uh, even if you're wrong. Have me back uh, again. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, it's a little different than the show I normally do, but I wanted to get Mike on to talk about some of these things uh, and the fact we couldn't have Mr. Femi in today. Good night and see you soon.